Um, I had the heavy privilege of studying about the first martyr um, over the last week. And as I did that, um, I, of course, came across so many stories of people who lost their life uh, for their faith. I read about William Tyndale, who was strangled before he was able to finish translating the Bible into English. I read about John Huss, who was singing a hymn as the kindling was stacked up to his neck and set on fire. And I read about even some more contemporary um, martyrs, uh, like Ronnie Smith, who was commissioned from Austin Stone Community Church. So he was a Texan who served in Benghazi, um, and he was killed in 2013. I also read about Kayla uh, Mueller, who died in the Jordan in 2015. She was actually held as a prisoner by ISIS for 18 months, and some of the last words that she wrote, she said, I have surrendered myself to our Creator. I have felt tenderly cradled in free fall. These things are really good to think about. With all the chaos going on around us, it really puts things in perspective. I also came across another story of a man who faced death, but he was not a martyr. And I think it's important for us to remember these stories too because um, it, we may not be a martyr. Um, his name was Andrew Reve, and he was a Frenchman who was born in the late 1500s. He served as a professor of theology in Holland. And those who knew him would say, um, like Stephen, he was full of the Holy Spirit. When he was 77 years old, he preached a sermon on Christmas Day. And immediately after that, he became very ill and declined rapidly, so rapidly, in fact, that he died on January 7th. So this devout man of God, a scholar for over 50 years, um, had these words to say in his last days. The sense of divine favor increases in me every moment. My pains are tolerable and my joys inestimable. I am no more vexed with earthly cares. You are my all, O oh Lord. My good is to approach you. You are the teacher. I have learned more divinity in these last 10 days than I did in the 50 years before. While the circumstances of his death vary greatly from the martyrs I listed, one thing is true. Um, they all faced those last days with the boldness of a lion. If you look at your handout, I um, wrote Proverbs 20, or typed Proverbs 28 at the top there, um, just reading the daily proverb, uh, I guess last week, and read this and thought, this is Stephen. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So before we jump into our text, let's orient ourselves to where we are in Acts. Acts, uh, Luke has done this, this thing for us as he's talked about the development of the church where he has zoomed in to the details, to the nitty gritty of the believers and then zoomed out to what was happening between the believers and the culture at large. So in chapter one, we zoomed in and we found the disciples in the upper room. Um, replacing Judas. Then we zoomed out and we see Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people um, responded. We zoomed back in. We found the fellowship of believers devoting themselves to, to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking bread together. We zoomed back out. We found Peter. We, we read about Peter and John healing, healing the lame beggar and being brought before the council. We zoomed back in, and we read that they were together with everything in common. Remember the prayer they prayed for boldness, not that the trial would be led up, but that they would be bold. And then we also saw the church deal with Ananias and Sapphira. We zoomed back out. We saw the apostles beaten and freed. And now we're going to zoom back in to the church to see what's happening amongst the believers if you have your copy of God's Word, I'm going to read, starting in chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to read that first section, 1 through 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, 
It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The passage we just read has two very similar bookends, and I want you to notice them. Verse 6 says, now in those days, that actually ties our passage to the verse immediately preceding. What was happening, look at what was happening in verse 42. It says, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. And so, what happened, in, what happened as a result? The disciples were increasing in number. And then at the end of the passage in verse, or at the end of that section in verse 7, we see that the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. We have these bookends of growth tied to the word of God going forth. It is through the teaching and preaching of the word that the church grows. You know, today, today we can draw a crowd in a lot of different ways. But the church is only built and strengthened through people embracing the gospel. In between these two bookends of growth, we zoom in and find some internal growth problems. You've probably heard it said, more money, more problems. Well, even more true would be more people, more problems. Remember Jesus' parable of the net in Matthew 13. When the net was cast, it gathers fish of every kind. So not all growth is pure growth. When the net is cast, we catch the good and the bad. We can expect that there will be friction in amongst God's people or amongst those who call themselves God's people. We just saw an example of this in Ananias and Sapphira. We're going to see another example later um, in Simon the Magician. It's really interesting to note that both of these internal disorders so far, Ananias and Sapphira and this complaint here, actually are coming out of what the church is doing very well. We've seen the church give so generously, care for one another with such generosity, and it's in this rich soil of generosity that there's this root of bitterness. But it's not only among the givers, Ananias and Sapphira, but among the receivers. And so this is a warning for both sides to guard your heart. The problem presented is that the Hellenist Jews felt like their widows were uncared for. Remember the Hellenist Jews had come from, had grown up out in the diaspora outside of Jerusalem and therefore they were very Greek in their language, their customs, and likely even their <coughs> worship habits. There were seven Greek synagogues in Jerusalem alone at this time. The passage says that they um, complained against the Hebrews in general. So they made a complaint against the whole for a mistake made by the leadership. You've never heard anything like that before, have you? The way Luke describes this, we get that there was some sort of motivation attributed to it. Maybe they felt like because of who they are, because of their upbringing, their culture, they were disliked just for that. And while they did not handle their concern as they should, they complained. You remember Paul later tells the church in Philippians, um, let there be no complaining or grumbling among you. Um, the apostles stepped up to solve the problem rightly. So what did the apostles say? Look at verse 2. They said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. It is not right may have sounded familiar to you. Uh, remember, Acts is recording the creation of the church. And you may remember another creation story where God said, it is not right. In Genesis 2.18, God said, it is not right that the man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable to him. 
this isn't the only place we see this phrase tied to um, a creation story. Um, in Exodus 18, God is creating the nation of Israel. And we find Moses, and it says he was sitting from morning until night, judging the people. Jethro, his father-in-law, comes to him and says, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for this thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. God has always been in the business of creating order out of chaos. And guys, we frequently give him a lot of chaos to work with, don't we? <laughs> that brings us to principle number one. When God's work is shared by many hands, the gospel takes new ground. When God's work is shared by many hands, the gospel takes new ground. All right, I have a little exercise for you. You've got to participate, and it's mm -hmm. going to be really hard for some of you. I want you to say, I can't do it all. Say, she can't do it all. Brent can't do it all. Very good, you pass. Um, the problem was addressed by bringing in more people to do the work. They appointed seven men to serve. Um, later on, we'll see this similar role called deacon. So some scholars think this is the start of that, although that term is not actually used here. Um, these men were chosen by the people, which allowed them to be part of the solution. All of these men were listed by their Greek names, and I just think this shows such care <coughs> for the group of people that feel neglected. And what happens when the church takes, sees a problem and humbly seeks to fix it by sharing the work amongst many hands? The gospel takes new ground. At the end of verse 7, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's a big deal. They gave up a lot to follow Christ. Their livelihoods and their way of life. So how do we apply this? Obviously, I'm going to ask you, what are your hands doing? How are you a part of this thing that God is doing? And the flip side of that is, do you know what service you are to be focused on? The apostles knew where their focus was, their priorities were supposed to be. Um, I had a mentor look at me one time and said, Megan, only one woman can be your husband's wife. Only one woman can be your, your children's mother. Many women can do lots of other things. So make sure that you have your priorities right. I really appreciated that perspective. Your study guide also asked you to think of ways you can encourage others. You can see a gift in one of your sisters and say, hey, I really think you're gifted in this. Have you thought about serving in this area? But I think there's also an application here for being served. Sometimes that's hard for us. Graciously accepting change is necessary for the advancement of the kingdom. Remember, the church is young here, but yet they're already having to change the, the way things are done in order to accommodate and meet needs. So the question would be, do you graciously accept change? I mean, can't you imagine that there would have been um, some temptation to, to kind of be against this change? Imagine a widow opening her door and saying, Nicanor, uh, who, who are you? I was really expecting Peter. I mean, I haven't been feeling so well, and I just thought maybe if I could get in a shadow, you know, I'd feel better. <laughs> As the body grows, leaders can't do it all. Um, they, but this is when the body also shines. And this is when you have an opportunity to graciously accept service by another. So let's pan out. We're going to follow one of these men and see how um, there is a crescendo, really, of friction with the culture and um, specifically um, the Sanhedrin. So let's read Acts 6, 8 through 15. 
Acts 6, I'm going to start in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. <clears throat> then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cranians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Sicily, always mess this up, girl, sorry. <laughs> Cilicia and Asia ro rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen literally means crowned one. There's actually two words for crown in the New Testament. One is diadema, which means a royal crown. And the other is Stephanos, which means a victor's crown. You can get a diadema. You can inherit a diadema. But the only way to get a Stephanos is to earn it. And I believe Stephen definitely did. How is he described? He's described as a man full of faith in the spirit in verse 5. Full of grace and power in verse 8. And in verse 55, it, he will be called full of the Holy Spirit. And full of literally means controlled by. We see scripture talk about being full of wine or controlled by it. Or we may say someone is full of rage, indicating their actions seem to not even be their own. Stephen was not only full of the Spirit at his death, but in his life. He was less like Samson. If you remember Samson, the Holy Spirit rushed upon him for a specific purpose in specific times. But he was more like Enoch, who consistently walked with God all of his days. In our very first lesson of Acts, Kim told us that we are called to be a witness. But we are all called to be a witness. But being an effective and faithful witness takes preparation. Martyr literally means witness. And Stephen prepared for his death by living a life devoted to, the ser to service and the word. It says that he went to this synagogue of the freedmen. These would have been Jews of the diaspora. Um, they would have been previous slaves who were now free, hence the name. And then it lists various cities. And scholars disagree whether this was one synagogue with many cities um, represented or if there were, in fact, several synagogues that Stephen visited. But the thing that stood out to me was that um, Cilicia was mentioned. And this is Saul's hometown. And we know that Saul was in Jerusalem because we're going to see him in just a few verses. So if he attended a synagogue, which he did, I'm sure, he would have attended this one. So Saul very likely heard Stephen's dispute, maybe was one of the ones disputing with him. But they could not answer him. I surely think that Luke saw this as a fulfillment of the words he wrote in Luke 21:15. In Luke 21:15 he said uh, he wrote um, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And that's exactly what we see. So let's examine these accusations. We see this theme around the accusations. We see Moses, the holy place, the law. Remember, Moses was, was integral in instituting the temple and the law. And so these these, this charge is that Stephen is standing against the temple and standing against the law. Whatever they thought Stephen had said was obviously an incendiary remark. This accusation sounds like the one against Jesus in Matthew 26, which you read in your homework. You also, in your homework, looked at John 2, where Jesus was standing in the temple with the whip and said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
In John's account, he tells us that Jesus is speaking about his body. It's also interesting to me that when Jesus was on the cross, people walked by him and said this. You who said you could rebuild the temple uh, in three days, save yourself. So it was common knowledge that Jesus had said something like this. And I couldn't help but wonder why. Why did Jesus say that in the temple? He used the temple language in the temple, knowing that they wouldn't understand what he was talking about. I mean, it would seem obvious that if he's standing there with a whip, talking about destroying the temple, that they would think he's talking about that building. But while we know he was talking about his body, we can also reason that he was talking about the physical temple because as he laid down his body and rose again, the physical temple and its systems were destroyed because Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the Shekinah glory. There were no more pilgrimages necessary. There was not one muscle that had to be moved to deal with sin. As Jesus said, it is finished. So is this what Stephen was talking about? Is this what Stephen was saying, that they're kind of getting confused? Well, the charge against Stephen sounds a little different. It says that he was claim, claiming that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Like it hasn't happened yet, whereas Jesus specifically tied that to his death and resurrection, which has already happened. So what is this discrepancy? Well, remember, Jesus is the cornerstone, which the builders rejected. He was integral to the foundation in a house that doesn't have a good foundation. Do the walls immediately fall down? No, but it is only a matter of time. The foundation that the temple is built on, the one of law and sacrifice, has been fulfilled and nullified in Christ. So... Another thing that seemed confusing is if Jesus and Stephen actually were saying this, why does Luke say that they were false witnesses? Well, the claim against Stephen is that he was committing blasphemy. So they are saying that he is against the temple and the customs. But what Stephen was preaching is fulfillment of them. They cannot comprehend how a destruction can also be a fulfillment I love the way I read one pastor um, say it when I read a sermon. He said, Jesus destroyed the temple the way a soldier's homecoming destroys the letter writing. Jesus destroyed the temple the way the sunrise destroys a nightlight. And Colossians 2.17 also tells us that the temple and the law was a shadow of things to come. Principle number two is that Jesus simultaneously fulfilled and destroyed the temple. And so for us, we remember that because as we talked about sharing the work with many hands earlier, we remember that that work earns us nothing. It doesn't make us more righteous because Jesus fulfilled it all. He did it all. These men look at Stephen and it says that he looks like an angel. All throughout scripture as we see angels, we see them described with light. And so it's reasonable to believe most commentators think that there was some sort of glow to Stephen. And even though this glow should have reminded them of Moses and his glow being near the presence of God, they didn't see it and they just demanded a response. And so we come to Stephen's response, his speech, which is the longest discourse recorded in Acts. And I just want you to imagine Stephen standing there in front of these men, these men who were, who were put there to judge, and these men who would have been the who's who of Jewish men, right? If Stephen grew up a good little Jewish boy and he had posters in his room and action figurines, it would have been these guys, <laughs> But everything about Stephen's defense demonstrates that he, realized he, he realizes he's supposed to be a witness, not a lawyer. 
He doesn't try to defend himself, but instead defends Jesus as the fulfillment. And his main point is that I am not the one demeaning the law and temple. You are. You'll remember with me, uh, God, the temple has been a place for God's presence. We're going to look at Stephen's speech and try to pick up um, some themes here. You girls are just amazing and picked up lots of amazing themes throughout this um, but we're going to look for one here. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I really want you to see these words as we kind of popcorn our way through here. We're going to first look at the first person Stephen mentions. It's Abraham. Um, so verse 2. And Stephen said, brothers and fathers. Chapter 7, verse 2. And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. So who appeared to Abraham? You can say. God. And where was he? Mesopotamia. Good. God made a covenant with this pagan man. And by his grace he became the father of many nations. But remember, this was pre-tabernacle, pre-temple, pre-nation of Israel. Yet God came to Abraham. The second person that Stephen talks about is Joseph. And we're going to read verse 9. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him. Who was with Joseph? Where was Joseph? Yes, the next few verses list Egypt six times. Was there a temple in Egypt? No, there wasn't. But God was with him. The third person he mentions is Moses. Uh, he doesn't just mention him. He actually describes three stages of Moses' life and how God was with him in each. His birth, his growing up in Pharaoh's family, and then in the wilderness. And we find Moses in the wilderness in verse 31. And he sees the, he sees the burning bush. And God, it says, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look. There came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Here's Moses in the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is more often... Um, associated kind of with the absence of God. We see it associated with judgment. We see it associated with temptation. And yet, Stephen is pointing out that God was there. Not only was he there, he called it holy ground. So God has always been with his people in various locations. He's never been confined solely to the temple. And what happened Stephen tells us that they refused to listen. They rejected. They rejected the very man whose face was at low because he had been in the presence of God. And I have to think that Stephen knew exactly where this whole thing was headed, right? He's talking to them and saying, you rejected him. You didn't listen. How could he think that this would be going any other way? If you... Move down to verse 44. Stephen talks about the temple. He says it's a good, it's a good gift. They were right to do as God prescribed and, and institute the temple. But his listeners were wrong to assume that God was confined to that building. Listen to what he says in verse 48. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne. And the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So why does this make them so mad? If God's work could only be done in the, in the walls of the temple, it would make God more like a, a genie in a bottle than a God who sees all, transcends all, and controls all. What power? these men would have. 
Though not as obvious as the golden calf that we read about, Israel rejected Moses and built a golden calf with their own hands. So this isn't as obvious as that idolatry, but these men are still just like their fathers. They are idolaters of self, of power. If what Stephen and Jesus said was true, they would lose their prestige, their power, yes, even their livelihood. But I want you to think for a second about how this has come about, right? These men are enraged right now. They are angry. But it didn't start out that way. Back in chapter 4, we see that the priests and Sadducees are described as greatly annoyed with the apostles. This frustration gives way to anger and violence as they beat them. And now... This full outrage will bear the fruit of murder. It is easy for us to think that our frustration is harmless. But I would say, if you look at your frustration, you can often see your idolatry. <laughs> One of my favorite explanations of idolatry is an idol is anything you are willing to sin to get. It's easy for us to kind of dismiss idol talk because none of us have a golden calf in our backyard. But whereas the Old Testament uses language of idolatry, the New Testament uses language of desire. And so the principle here is that frustration often reveals idolatry. Frustration often reveals idolatry. And to apply this, I would ask you, do you seek out idols behind your frustration? Do you deal with frustration when it, it rears its head? Or do you wait until it is full-blown in anger? I, I would encourage you to ask the Lord to make you sensitive to the sighs, the murmurings, or the venting that reveal frustration in your life so that no sin would gain a stronghold. And now we will see the culmination of this whole thing. In verse 50, 51, Stephen's tone changed. He goes from recounting these historical accounts to a full-out counter-accusation. He says, you are stiff-necked, you are just like your father's. And I wonder what he saw in the face of these men that made him realize it was time to pull out all the stops, to leave it all on the field. In many of our texts, we have a break after his words in verse 53. And then verse 54 says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. And so it seems like Stephen's speech may have ended there, but actually this was happening simultaneously. And so the, the high point of his speech, the, the, the moment that I don't want you to miss, the last words of his, his speech were, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen's faith has just become sight. He affirms that Jesus Christ is God, that he is transcendent, the God of glory, who has revealed himself to Abraham and throughout Israel's history, now reveals his presence in a special way to Stephen. And here we see Jesus standing, not sitting. We see him in other places in the Bible, you know, he's seated at the right hand of God, and here he's standing. Um, scholars have long have have picked up on that and just kind of thought, what could that mean? But I mean, perhaps he is ready to welcome the very first martyr. These men cover their ears and they rush at him, an action that seems much more fitting to a two-year-old temper tantrum than it does to these men who are. Um, prestigious and supposed to be experienced judges they rush at him it also reminds me of a story I read about the Scottish Covenanters who when they 
were um, martyred, the drums were ordered to play loud enough that no one could hear their final words. Uh, but they rushed at him, they drug him out of the city, and they began stoning him. The word stoning here is the imperfect tense, and it's repeated twice. It indicates that the throwing of stones went on for some time. They removed their outer garments, maybe so they could throw better and harder, or maybe so they wouldn't get them bloody. And whose feet did they lay them at? Saul. Stephen, in verse 60, uses his very last breath to say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He uses his very last breath to bless his enemies. And you know what, Jesus, you know what, God is very soon going to answer that prayer through the very man who stood there approving. And Paul himself will become a martyr. But as he said this, we hear the words of our Savior echoed. There was no bitterness in Stephen. There was no deserving attitude. And there was no frustration. I love that it is said that Stephen fell asleep. What a glorious picture of the peace with which believers can face death. And also the hope that we have that when we wake up, we will be in the presence of Jesus. As I thought over the death of Stephen and of these other martyrs that I read about, it, it was just so obvious that death is not some sort of final exam that we can cram for. Your fourth principle is that we are only ready to die for Christ if we are living for him. We are only ready to die for Christ if we are living for him. None of the martyrs were seeking to be martyrs. They only wanted to live as Christ. We often wonder, could I endure suffering for Christ in the hour of persecution? Or even in the hour of ordinary death? And the answer is no, I couldn't. Not in myself. We will not be left to ourselves. The power of the Holy Spirit gives extraordinary grace for the extraordinary trial of death, no matter how it comes. You may never face martyrdom, but you will face death. As I was preparing for this talk, I interviewed the person that I know, I believe is the most familiar with death of anyone I know. My mom worked for a hospice for 27 years, and she has been beside over 500 people as they take their final breaths. She told me story after story of believer who faced death like Andrew Rive, who faced death like bold like a lion. Believers whose last words were things like to their family, don't worry, or it is beautiful. Do you see the angels? But she also told me stories of atheists, Scientologists, and Wiccans who were in turmoil and they could not be made comfortable with any amount of pain medication, almost as if their pain was more than just physical. I believe that we can die like Stephen, no matter how death comes to us. We can be speaking of Christ's glory until our final breath. We can desire nothing that this world has to offer. We can only desire Christ. And we can do away with bitterness, frustration, self-pity. So I would ask you, do you live like death is the ultimate enemy? It's an enemy. Scripture tells us it is an enemy. But it also tells us that death has been defeated by our Lord Jesus Christ. Does your life bear witness to this? There was a time in my life where I was... It's visited me several different times in my life, I should say, but um, where I was really preoccupied with death, death of myself, death of my kids, death of my husband, um, and it just would, it, it was really almost just plagued my thoughts. Some of those things were very just 
like statistically impossible. And so I would preach that to myself. This is statistically impossible. It's not going to happen. But you know, that never, that never did anything. Not until I began to preach to myself, come what may, he will give you grace. You have today to live. May we, like Andrew Reve, be able to say in our final hours, days, or months, the sense of divine favor increases in me every moment. My pains are tolerable, but my joys inestimable. I am no more vexed with earthly cares. Let's pray. God, you, you reign over all, and you reign over death, and you have made that so obvious through Christ that he has victory over death. God, we praise you that what you are doing, your kingdom work is so wonderful that people, countless people have, have seen the value of it and have served you unto death. What a testimony those stories are. Lord, I pray that we would be bold as a lion, that we would be bold to live for you, so that when our day comes, we will be bold to face death, not as a final enemy, but as one that has been defeated in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray.